and take it away. Hello, and welcome to the Massachusetts Library Association Reader's Advisory Section meeting here on this day, Thursday, the 18th of November in the year of Audrey Lord 2021. <laughs> We're talking about romance today because I love romance. I even have pink post-it notes to prove how much I love romance. Um, we have decided to present on romance today because by request there were members of this group who were like I want to learn more about romance and Anna and I said heck yes and so here we are um the romance genre accounts for more than half of fiction purchased in the United States I don't remember where that statistic came from but y'all are library workers so you could probably track it down if you wanted to um and yet, and yet, everyone's like, oh, romance, or I only read trashy things like romance, or I'm so ashamed of romance. Romance readers are the reason for ebooks because they were the ones with their Sony readers back in the 90s reading romances on the subway so that no one could see the covers of the books. Um, it's not like so much a shame thing as it is a just get over yourself thing. And I am not going to sit here and feed you arguments that Sarah McLean, noted romance advocate and author, has done better on her website, in her blog, in the Washington Post, etc. There is, it is at least twice a year that Twitter explodes in disrespect for romance. And there are great, there are always think pieces in the New York Times or online about what romance is and what romance is like, and they are never written by a romance reader or advocate or author. I have been reading romance for mm, nearly 40 years. I started reading white cover Harlequin Presents at my grandmother's house when I visited her as a child. And I know that I was, um, I read some of those before I like moved on to Kathleen Woodowis. There were a couple of those. My aunt had a Harlequin subscription. And so there were grocery bags of these books at my grandmother's house where I spent time each summer. And I was a voracious reader. And my grandmother lived in Arkansas. So going outside was a misery and nobody tried to make you go outside if you were a relatively well-behaved child. So it was great. I got to read a whole lot of stuff. Um, I made some notes in preparing for this, and I'm not gonna be able to find them right now, but I mostly was, I told Anna that I was gonna keep it to a sentence on each decade where, you know, the 60s were when Mills and Boone and Harlequin Presents got started in the same company. They just had different branding in the UK, Canada, and the US. And then in the 70s, you got those doorstop bodice rippers and that, term was very applicable to these. And I'm thinking of Kathleen Woodowis as the wolf and the dove and the flame and the flower, which had um, some, some real content warning kind of content um, at the time. It, there was a lot of, um, you know, uh, you, there, just a lot of issues around consent and, um, you know, a lot of, uh, subjugation of women to their men. Um, and that was what was being read and written in the in the 70s. And in the 80s, it started to like move a little bit more towards some sassiness. And I in the 80s, I was reading piles of the zebra regency romance and so they were little slim like harlequin presents romances but they were set in the regency and they were squeaky clean there was like a kiss on or a proposal on the last page but they were like um they were like georgette hair light for those of us who didn't read georgette hair in the 40s and 50s which i didn't even like acknowledge that i'd started i started in the 60s because of um just being arbitrary and 
so in the eight and then so then there were also a, a real expansion of the lines. So Silhouette was separate from Harlequin and each of them had their different lines. There were the Harlequin American romances and the super romances and the Silhouette desires. They had the red covers and actual sex in them. And, but there was also Silhouette special edition, which were just a little bit fatter and had a little bit more character development there. Um, and these were still subscription based where people got them and you could find piles of them at your library book sale or your library may even have purchased them and you could just like take piles of them home and read them. Um, and in the 90s, there was an expansion of uh, female autonomy and um, women had orgasms in them. Oh my God. I read Amanda Quick's single word titles. There are 13 of them. Um, and I have read all of them six or eight times each because Amanda Quick, for like a certain part of your life, um, oh, this is a good segue into formula. People say, oh, they're formulaic. The same thing happens all the time. And as a reader, I'm like, yes, and because I um, like Amanda Quick's romances, there is a female orgasm at or around page 142. And it always comes before a male orgasm. And I am absolutely here for that. Um, that's why I've read all of those books six or eight times. And I am like a policy not rereader. Um, and so, and moving forward, you begin to like mush around the edges of women's fiction and chick lit in the 90s and 2000s and 2010s, where you're seeing an increase in female autonomy and increase in female pleasure. The books are written by feminists for feminists. The whole point of romance is the, the, um, the woman finding uh, joy and pleasure in her life through partnership with someone else. The whole, the thing that I wrote at the top of my sheet that I didn't even lead with for y'all was romance requires a happily ever after or a happily for now. We will not be taking any further questions on that topic. That is how a romance is defined. No, Anna, no, Anna, no, Anna. If, this, if one of them dies, Nicholas Sparks, it is not a romance. Um, if one of them is terminally ill, Lurleen McDaniel, it is not a romance. It can be a romance for teens just because I, as a middle-aged woman, think it's extremely unlikely that teenage lovers are going to spend their lives together. There's still a place in the world for teen romance. And I was just at a panel, I was at the Macmillan Teen Romance panel on Monday, and one of the authors is still married to the man she met the first day of college when she was 17. And I was like, oh my God, when I, when I think about who I was dating when I was 17, I, um, I am real glad that I'm not, but there are happily ever afters that happen real young. They're not super common. There's a suspension of disbelief um, and so on. But what you're going to find now as a romance reader is a world that is so richly populated with so many different people and styles and um, situations. They're, they're so great. I read a romance, um, The Right Swipe by Alicia Ray. They're a Tinder one night stand who like accidentally meet again later. It's it's like super, it's super relevant to the 21st century. And there, there are all kinds of, you know, and like one of them is a mogul and the other one is, they're just, I can't express enough how beautiful the growth of romance content has been over the last 50 years that I just tried to go through really quickly. Um, and I didn't take 10 minutes, so that's pretty good on my part. Anna, would you like to interject anything at this time besides a question about happily ever afters? Um, I have a couple questions. One is, these are all leading questions. Is a romance, we, when we're talking about romance, we're talking about building relationships, not necessarily love, but intimate relationships on some level. But are we just talking about a man and a woman? 
I'm so glad you asked. A romance can be between a man and a woman, two men, two women, or multiple people. Sometimes also werewolves and bears. There are shape-shifting romances um, and there are paranormal romances, which I will probably talk a little bit more about or toss it to Pam about. Um, but the happily ever after is in that universe for the main characters, whoever they are. Even if they're like lizardy dragons, Katie McAllister. <laughs> Um, I, I have a sort of a timeline thing, which is that the explicitness of mainstream published romances has been increasing throughout the timeline that you were talking about. Like, you know, Georgette Hare is going to have a kiss, but now, um, thank you, Pam. Um, love is love, even for lizardy people. I'm glad that you mentioned this, but it's not, it's not precisely the path because I can tell you those rape bodice rippers yeah. in the seventies were extremely explicit. I learned a whole lot from them for good or ill. <laughs> um, so, but finish your question. I'm sorry. All right, so my question is, uh, my colleague Elizabeth asked me this earlier. She was like, what is the deal with dark romance? And we had to look it up because um, it is a romance that is going to be extremely angsty and that would personally does not agree with my pref preferred taste, but it might have a forbidden relationship such as, thank you, that's Katie Roberts, Neon Gods. It might have a forbidden relationship. It might even be uh, on the order of like incestual, or uh, otherwise problematic by certain cultural standards. Teacher, student. Teacher, student. Um, so yeah, so go ahead with, with your... Uh, okay, um, thanks. So with dark romance, and I feel like dark romance probably also has a range because I have, have really loved some angsty romance. Anna Campbell is an Australian historical writer. They're set in London, but she's Australian. And she has written some super angsty historical romances that were like plenty sexy that I just loved. And I, I don't go in for misery. I, any of y'all who have heard me talk about reading, I am here for pleasure, thank you. I do not want people to be traumatized because I've got plenty of that myself, thanks, and so on. But um, so they're, they're angsty, but then also like the forbidden factor. There are romances, ooh, slave master has come up in conversation a lot lately. I think that that's um, definitely, uh, if we are talking about enslaved persons for reals, then yes, I mean that you definitely want to know about that before you read it. Um, and there are, uh, Pam, you made me think of there, there's always conversation on the internet when there is a romance novel that has like a Nazi officer as the hero. And there, it, there are, there are hard stops for some readers. Like I'm uh, a person who, enslaves people or uh, perpetuates genocide is not sexy to me personally. I, I don't know, there obviously is some kind of market because these things happen, but um, I uh, am going to avoid them myself. Um, there, but thinking, it, this makes me think about just like cozy mysteries, there are romances for everyone like you know there's the cozy mystery with the yoga teacher who has a dog there are romances with yoga teachers who have dogs they don't come out in series like the yoga teacher with a dog mysteries do but they you can find them um i don't have anything in my hands right now because i just cleaned out my office i was going to look for in in, you know, in some of your fantasy books, you have the map in the front. In some romance books, you have the family tree in the front where it shows you all of the people who have hooked up over the years. 
and they're super fun because you can like go through and check off all the ones you read or you can see how the whole universe intersects and i'm thinking of the bridgertons by julia quinn and the sinsters by stephanie lawrence those are two historical romance series that um that have great uh lots of sex and great um family relationships there one of my friends who i i got her to start reading romance by getting her to read outlander that was her gateway and this was the 90s i mean we've been friends for a really long time now and um but she as she went from outlander to stephanie lawrence and she was like the six page sex scenes are just great i'm like right you know there's um and so your readers I realize I haven't been talking about your readers, but I'm going to move this into readers advisory y'all here we are. Your readers are going to have things that they like and things that they want in their books, you can ask a romance reader hey what do you like to read. And she is very likely going to say I like to read romances that are set in 1813 in London with anachronistically saucy heroines and explicit sex. And that's my own profile, but many, many readers have that kind of profile for their own tastes and so that's where you will find um a, a gateway into like who likes what subgenres there are subgenres that just like there are heroines of every career there are subgenres yes anna um if you scroll down in our agenda document you will see some subgenres yes anna put together a really beautiful infographic in the um and it's in embedded in the agenda and which is linked in the chat so please go look at that because it's going to include stuff that i forget there she just put it in again and it's also going to uh be it's much prettier than looking at me while i'm talking about hey there's historical and you know i talk a lot about 1813 london which is the regency and is a historical but like the Regency romance is one subgenre that is a squeaky clean set during the Regency. And then there are Regency historicals. There are historical romances that are set in the Regency that have explicit sex. And those are like Regency historicals. There is so much lingo in here. Your patron is possibly going to know what they like, but they might not know what we call it. And that's something that you need to be able to get at. Yes, Anna. So what if someone comes to you and says, I'm looking for a good romance? As with most readers advisory interviews, tell me a little bit about what you like in a romance is a really uh -huh. good way to go. I like fluffy lesbians in space lesbians in space yes but i like i like romances where no one is really sad i want things i want things where everything is pretty easy do you have a setting that you like because there's historical there's space there's um right now it's good i like things that happen in america contemporary america that with some readers that could be code for white people um with anna it is not code for white people <laughs> i think that you would really like talia hibbert's books even that's though they're set in london what i know um alicia ray rye uh alexis daria mm, helen wong jasmine guillory uh, yay, I'm so glad you're reading Talia Hibbert, Laura. I just loved, loved, loved those, that trilogy, the, the Brown Sisters. Um, but so I think Anna's testing me. I think she's trying to give you guys an example of, of the kinds of things that are out there. Um, but she is nudging me into my, my personal and also the MLA RA section and the Western Mass Readers Advisory Roundtables uh, focus and not so secret agenda of inclusivity in all things and there are genres we just read our roundtable just did um historical true crime 
and we were able to find a gay serial killer in the 90s but it was really hard to it the the true crime genre does not it, it's pretty white just like you know serial killers are pretty white pretty 30s pretty men and um so so they're but but romance has like so much available. There are amazing, yes, Anna. I was gonna say, um, you might run into romance readers who are very hardcore, see what I did there. Um, and they're like, well, I'm reading all of these, but you don't have, like no one has them anywhere. Um, and they want to get them from the library, but you go to Ingram or whatever to order them and they're, they're not available in paper. They're only uh, eBooks. And that's fine because most romance readers are like, okay with eBooks. Um, but you need to know what your systems like overdrive purchasing setup is like in CW Mars, it's, it's recommendation driven but I have, you know, we have a certain budget to buy things that, you know, Springfield people get to, to use first. And then after, if there's no one from Springfield that wants it, everyone else can use it. So just be aware in, in the terms of publishing, your patrons might know about stuff that's not mainstream, but is available in e original. And so, you know, you might need to dig a little bit deeper to help those people and and because they're pretty used to going out and getting it on their own because libraries don't prioritize romance purchasing. That was a segue slash digression. What is it segueing to? <laughs> Whatever you were okay. saying. Um, so uh, Anna's right in that you will have um, there are libraries that don't prioritize the purchasing of romance. And then there are libraries where uh, someone like me or Anna has like some input into the fiction purchasing. And so you will find very, very personalized romance <laughs> collections in some libraries. Um, and uh, the Forbes library does not have separate genre sections. And Springfield only got genres for their mass market paperbacks. But um, so, you know, you can go wandering through the stacks at Forbes and you can find, you know, you'll get to Christina Lawrence and you're like, oh, there's a bunch of Christina Lawrence or you'll get to um, Talia Hibbert and you're like, oh, clearly I'll even put those on a list. Um, you, but I, I mean, I work across the road from Smith College in Northampton where there are lots of women readers and you would think that there were, um, I didn't talk about the the sexism in the trashiness of romance. And you can read about that on the internet. But um, I, the romances that I put on display here at Forbes do not get checked out when I do a romance display. I did a romance display and I left it up for two weeks because I was like really, really mad <laughs> and nothing went off it for two weeks. Pro tip, don't leave a display up for two whole weeks if nothing gets checked out off of it. Um, but you have our staff picks stands that say, you know, Aline likes to read romances and, and gritty mysteries. And I always have romances on there and those do get checked out. And I also once had a, um, a person come up to the reference desk and say, is Aline here? And I was like, yeah, I'm Aline. Is there something I can help you with? And the, the person was like, I just wanted to thank you for promoting romance on your staff picks thing because that's I'm a romance author and it's just really nice to see that in a public library. And I was like, oh really? Who are you? And she's like, I'm Sherry Thomas. And I was like, ah. Um, Sherry Thomas writes fantasy. She writes um, historical mysteries. She writes some sexy romances. She's just amazing and wonderful. And she was like visiting for a conference and had just like come in the library by accident. And I, there are a whole lot of romance authors that I might not have heard of and read their books, although I would have been gracious to any of them. And I was just really, really excited by that. Um, and I tell that story a lot. Sorry if you've had to sit through it before. Pam. <laughs> oh, you hadn't heard it before? Oh, I swear I, I told it to some, some group you were in. Um, great. So, uh, and she's also not white. Um, but 
knowing what your patrons are after. I mean, our, our romances circulate. They don't not circulate. We send things out on hold through all of CWMRs. They get checked out from my staff picks and Molly's staff picks. Um, and they, they move. They just, I don't, you know, I maybe somebody just doesn't want to see a like romance for your commute display and, and figuring that out is good. But there's also, um, Anna was talking about patrons who are accustomed to not finding the books that they want to read in the library, but they still ask for them. Thank goodness. There are also folks who are like, so I read this book and it's really good. And I wondered if you had more like it because they either, they either don't realize that it's romance or they are trying to like skirt around you possibly saying <gasps> romance. Um, and so, so be, be aware of that and, and be careful with it there. You know, I am, a per, I had a patron who come, she still comes to me, but she's like, she snuck up to the reference desk one day and she wanted horror. And she was like, and I'd like jumped up and ran out to the stacks with her because I had some ideas. It was around the beginning of Josh Mallerman's career when this happened. And so I was like, yay, there are a couple of young people writing romance, writing horror too. And it's the same sort of thing. You know, this patron is now like my buddy because she's like, I feel kind of weird when I ask for this and greeting her with, with, um, enthusiasm when she said that was was like a positive thing and we as librarians as library workers we have so much power with patrons that that we might not even recognize I mean we understand that we're behind the great wall of of desk and we are the authority figures and we shake them down for fines or tell them that they can't check anything out because their card is blocked or whatever and all of those things are things that I try to avoid at all costs but um but even something sort of like oh well I don't really read those let me see if I can find something for you just leave that off of the beginning, you know, I, I do end up in the stacks with someone who loves Oprah books and I hand them a book that is going to make them cry for weeks. And they're like, did you like it? And I'm like, you know, I, this particular kind of books, not super my style. And I always say, I like to read romances because I'm, I only want to happily ever after. And there's too much going on in this book for me, but being, being approachable and being human and, um, and engaging with folks who have come to you to ask for something good to read is, is really, really important. And while every one of us like has their favorite book in their back pocket and wants everybody in the world to read it, you know, we still have to practice slowing down a little bit and not, you know, not everybody's going to want to read Connie Willis, Aline, but, um, but, but being able to be like, so what do you, what do you like to read? Oh my gosh, I just heard about this. Um, and walking someone to the new book room. If you've got a big new book section where you can like find stuff. I like our new book room because it's like along an entire wall of a seating area is like A to Z fiction. So there's like a chunk of stuff there. I can find things. I have worked with like a new book section that was just a single stack that I could never find anything in. But going out into all of the fiction can be too much for you as a staff member. And it's definitely too much for a patron to be like, yeah, come out here and look for the mystery stickers. It's, it's tough, but finding that balance, I always have to spend a little time talking about being welcoming. Yes, Anna. Well, I just wanted to, to reiterate that and say that, that romance readers have, have heard all of the um, snide commentary from un unwarranted snide commentary from you know people checking out their books to people that they wanted to help them so they are not necessarily inclined to ask for help you might see them browsing your romance section but um you know so approach enthusiastically if you do approach the people that that have come to me you know when 50 shades was a thing um and I was like, oh yeah, I yeah, I read that and I read a couple others. They were like visibly relieved that I had had also read them. Um, and so even if you haven't read them, just like don't make any judgmental faces <laughs> if you can if you can help it, uh, because they'll they will never come back. Yeah. And 
romance is is like the the number one genre of shame. Um, like my reader who reads horror was was also um, you know she had like been shamed at some point for liking to see people cut up, and she has very rule. She has very strict rules. She does not want her young people to get cut up. She only wants you know. Whenever I'm like, here, the kid disappears. And she's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, but, um, but, so, but think that that's a very good point, Anna. And it's also, um, I get really, really excited when someone asks me for romance. But I also have to tell you that there is, there's a whole lot of women's fiction that is romance. And because they've marketed it as women's fiction, then the writers and the editors and the publishers, they don't seem to know that it's romance. There was a book that came out a few years ago called The City Baker's Guide to Country Living by Louise Miller. And she was like a Boston pastry chef who set her restaurant on fire and then ran away to Vermont and you know started making pies at the diner or something or at one of you know it was it had a very stars hollow kind of thing going on but i swear to you this was women's fiction because it was given to me to review for book list and that's my category but it had like five terrible romance tropes in it that n that none of them knew were terrible romance tropes because they weren't romance readers and i was like just checking them off and the best thing i'm so excited and i don't think i told you this my my library reads patron you know i have that one patron who just like gets all her books off the library reads display she had the city the city baker's guide to country living in her stack the other day and i was like hey do you like romance and she was like no and i was like i cannot wait to hear what you think of this book and she was like okay and i mean she and i talk about reading and books and stuff you know i am always like i i have a library reads display that is ongoing and is always full and that's where she goes to find her books because she figured it out that that's the easiest way to browse a bunch of good stuff anyway it's it's very exciting yes anna i have a segue and it is to uh romance novel tropes because that Yay! Is, that is one way to to help someone you know they don't know what they're looking for but they have liked books with fake relationships well okay we can do that so um, I did put a bunch of the tropes on the bottom of the graphic. Um, some people have tropes that they love and some people have tropes that they want to avoid. So someone might say, I hate secret babies. That would be Eileen. Eileen hates secret babies. Also, she hates not secret babies <laughs> um, in her romance novels. She does not want babies anywhere <laughs> near the romance. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe they're looking for second chance romances maybe you know um forbidden love forks forced proximity that's a good one um there's that one lesbian romance where they're stuck in an elevator <laughs> yes oh yeah that's really good i was just like there was only one bed right only one bed um so if you if you do happen to get a romance reader rather than someone who's like i just don't know where to start but i feel like i read red white and royal blue and i like the i like the romance part um, that's one problem, but if they do like romance, then you can be like, okay, so royals, yes or no? Uh, marriage of convenience? Historical? Yes or no? And you can sort of just like test the waters with a few of those. Is that all you wanted to say about tropes? You can talk about tropes longer if you want. Do you, do you want me to? No, that's okay. I'm good. Okay, um, I have been talking for nearly half an hour and nobody has um, asked me any questions except Anna who was just trying to direct my, my flow. So does anyone have any questions that they would like to bring up or ask or anything? You can put them in the chat if you don't wanna unmute yourself or. Pam has pointed out that it's good to ask what TV and movies they like. So if they say they really like Hallmark Christmas movies, well, there are a bunch of books that are basically analog to those and also they are publishing books now <laughs> so you can just look for hallmark in your uh catalog and limited and she can also start with debbie mccomber like four of her books have been made into christmas movies and she has a ton of christmas romances nine Ooh, lives a map. Christmas, the line nine lives of christmas is a book as well as a delightful movie about cats and firefighters Yes, and a, a woman training to be a vet. 
Yes. And it stars Brandon Routh, who was a Superman in some TV show. Oh, anyway, it's nice. Nine Lives of Christmas is our rewatch of all of them. And we, we usually watch like 30 over the course of the season and we try to watch the new ones. Um, and if you are a Hallmark movie watcher, you should definitely go to Lifetime because sometimes they have a gay sidekick um, and there are way more people of color on Lifetime. Um, so I do... I, I did want to talk about the the genres, the subgenres that I put on here. That's a good question, Nicole. This is a really good question, Nicole. The genre I forgot, the subgenre I forgot, is inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, contemporary means set now-ish. Um, historical can be set in any time period. There is a preference, a strong bias toward um, England of a certain time period, but more and more you're you're going outside that time period. Alyssa Cole, uh, Civil War, Beverly Jenkins is great if you want some American historical. Um, and, and they're in the Wild West sometimes. I am not a big fan of Wild West romances, but they're out there and people love them. Romantic suspense is, I guess, also usually contemporary, but it has a strong um, mystery element. The romance is still going to be in the forefront, but there's also something else going on and people are in peril. Erotic romance is going to be more on the side of explicit sex. Maybe it's not even, maybe love isn't even... Um, uh, a factor, but they are going to be very happy with whatever they uh, end up doing together. Um, sports romance, I should probably have put inspirational in here, but sports romance is actually a strong subgenre, so I put it on here. Um, young adult. Oh my God, I love hockey romances for some reason. <laughs> for some reason. Young adult, again, young adult is a whole age range. It's not actually, it's, but, but it is a strong uh, genre in in young adult publishing. I just put a couple ones. Speculative, science fiction, fantasy. Yes. What about new adult? Ugh, new adult was a thing that they tried to make happen that did not happen. So stop it. <laughs> um, and I put on paranormal, which was huge, huge, huge in the '90s and early 2000s, and has um, calmed down significantly, but is still a factor. I would say. Um, inspirational, which uh, which we can segue to Nicole's question of does romance always equal sex? Would there be a good way to ask how comfortable patron is with explicit sex scenes? Yes, there is a good way to do that. Go, Aline. I um, I, depending on how you're feeling with the patron, like I approach everyone with a sort of jolly, chummy kind of kind of vibe and I'm sort of like how saucy do you like it to be but you will you can find the language that you want there are um there are romance websites that tell you all about them and they they rank them by chili peppers in terms of like hotness and um and your readers will often be able to tell you like closed door or in bed with them, you know, because there are a whole lot of like, they were kissing and then they like went into her bedroom and then like the next morning they were brushing their teeth. There are, um, there, there are romances at every point along the, um, the spiciness section se uh, spectrum. I, I do not like to use the word clean. I don't think that's, um, that is not what we want to be perpetuating. Um, I realize that some explicit romances are extremely filthy, but I, I choose not to use the clean and filth, clean and dirty thing. I go with saucy or spicy or, um, ex and sometimes I'm, I ask about explicit and sometimes I'm like, do you want the action behind the bedroom door or do you want the action on the page? That's another way you can check because um, action can mean different things to different people. But you know, when you're talking about romances, you're probably pointing at the sex if you talk about action. Um, if you're talking about forensic mysteries, that would be the uh, autopsy being on the page or <laughs> off the page. Uh, so yeah, um, did I get did I get to your question, Nicole? Did that like give you some? Okay, thank you. 
Um, and so like on this chart, the, the Duke, the Lady and the Baby by uh, Vanessa Riley is a historical romance that is closed door that you could give to someone. Um, but it is, you can use novelist. Um, I think that they have a subcategory but yes, sometimes like gentle or clean are the words that will be used. Yes. I got a parcel in the mail from Shadow Mountain Publishing, or maybe it was from Consortium and Shadow Mountain Publishing is one of them. And they have mis they have mysteries and romances that they they promote as clean. Yeah. I mean, I, I like read the back of these books and you know, I'm gonna tweet about them because they sent me a galley and that's what I do. But I was like, I was reading the back and I'm like, that looks like a great story. And then I saw this like little tiny writing at the bottom. All of our books are squeaky clean. And I was like, ah. So um, another, another phrase that it doesn't apply so much to romance but it might apply to other things but when you are suggesting things to readers is family friendly um, because you know, some folks want to listen to a mystery on a road trip with, you know, if they've got like tweens or something, we, we have a, we have pretty good luck listening to things that we all enjoy when we're on a family road trip these days. But, um, and, you know, and you get tired of how to train your dragon after the third listening um, with your younger people, but you can find mystery and you're, you may or may not want romances, but there's not going to be, but mystery, sometimes they have sex with the villain by accident, Kinsey Malone. And um, it's good to know what um, family friendly is also a thing to like look for or consider. I, um, I kind of feel like I have dumped a lot of knowledge, not necessarily knowledge. Yes, The Lady in the High Woman, Sarah Eden was one of the books that I got. Um, I've, I've given y'all a bunch of information that I think to be pretty, pretty uh, standard. I feel like this is like giving you a good baseline, but I am happy to answer questions or try to answer questions or engage Anna and Pam uh, if you've got anything else you want to look for. Yes, Anna. I, so um, you, if you have any responsibility for uh, purchasing books, you might be wondering where to find reviews of things. Um, Library Journal and Booklist um, do review romance and they had, uh, Library Journal had an erotic romance column, but the last one that came out was in 2019. So I don't know if Ashley is doing something else. Yes. And Booklist Booklist publishes between 12 and 24 issues a year. Some of them are, you know, some months there's one on the 1st and the 15th and some months there's not, but they do every year they do like a spotlight on romance issue. And that's like a good place to do some catching up as a, if you are the kind of person who like reading lists of books is a way that you can sometimes get things into your brain. Those, those those issues are really, really helpful because they're like the best debut romances of the last year, the best historical romances of the last year. And they're looking at stuff on an annual basis. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen very briefly because I can. Um, if you're looking for, <laughs> if you are looking for uh, reviews by romance readers, you can go to Smart Bitches Trashy Books. And they actually have this thing called a book finder over here under blog. And so you click on book finder, maybe you try to click on book finder. Okay. I'm and gonna then, promote myself and tell you that I was on there on her podcast once. You can say, I'm looking, you know, your patron's looking for, uh, let's say an inspirational book. No, let's say a paranormal book, looking for paranormal romance. And they like, um, fake relationships, right? And then you can say there, are, you can add a second theme um, or you can say, oh, I want there to be firefighters as well in my paranormal fake relationship. Uh, and then you know, well, this is our, so there are four books with uh, paranormal fake relationships. So this is a pretty good way to just like, if you're like, I just don't know, this is a very specific question. You can use the book finder. And if you 
they also have an option, like if there's too many results, to hide the books that have not been reviewed by anyone on the site. So these are just ones that are popping up. Um, and now I kind of want to read not the witch you you wed, but it might have a secret baby. So um, I, I feel like we have a copy of that at home. I just wanted everyone to know about this resource because they they have tried to make it pretty pretty easy for um, for anyone who doesn't necessarily have like uh, something in mind. Um, so. It looks fun to browse too, because I was definitely going to want to go find a Regency um, firefighter <laughs> romance. You know, the, you can, picking one from column A and one from column B could be really good. And um, I can tell you, yes, Laura, that site is super, super awesome. I, hey, I, I, if you are a TikTok brarian, as Pam is, it seems, <laughs> you can get good books too. There are, there are great, I mean, TikTok is, is like a whole new world. It makes me like super extra old. And I also there's with my child this morning. <laughs> really? Yes. Is, is, is your child on TikTok? No, but he listened to uh, an episode of ologies about TikTokology last night. And he was telling me all about how um, they do updates all the time so that, um, people are just used to there being updates instead of waiting a long time between updates and having everyone be mad about it. See, that's that's what you should do with your library website. That's what you should do with anything. Everything should be iterative. It should be like, oh, let me get rid of this bug and just do it. Don't like save it all up for a, a new release. Um, and I, can't, I can tell you from all the middle schoolers that I interact with regularly is that, um, Every every different school has been having children doing things that they they were told to do on TikTok. So, uh, yeah, interesting. It's a it's, uh, it's it's a thing. But we we did um, readers advisory. We did reader advisory Instagram posts, and we did do a like um, hot on book talk uh, post a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't seen Springfield Library's Instagram, they have really, really good reader's advisory posts, which will be tied to like today is National Pickle Day kind of things or, or holidays that you know more about or things that are happening in the news or culture that um, they, they do all of these like immediately relevant things and they are vetted for inclusivity before they are posted, which is also super awesome. Um, I, it is 1059. And so I kind of feel like so let's segueing stop. to the business meeting right. is well, good. Then, before then, I would like everyone to uh, recommend a romance or romance adjacent thing. And I have one more question, which is, is the movie Speed a romance? The movie Speed is most definitely romantic suspense. Okay, thanks. Um, because the bus blowing up is a factor. <laughs> it is a factor. So I'm going to go first and recommend Payback's A Witch as a nice contemporary paranormal in which a witch goes back to her small town of origin because she has some family thing that she has to do. And um, she has been gone because of her terrible ex-boyfriend from high school and she finds out that her best friend and this other super hot unattainable girl have also been done wrong by this ex-boyfriend and so they band together to make his life more difficult and it is a romance between her and the hot unattainable girl so yay that's by Elena Harper or Lana Harper. It's on the sheet. Anyone else been reading a, any or has a romance to recommend? So I held this up already, but I'll hold it up again. It's called Neon Gods by Katie Robert. Um, I started this yesterday at lunch and I've already read 300 pages of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is Greek mythology, but modern. So this is um, Hades and Persephone. Um, Persephone goes on the run from Zeus who wants to marry her. She takes off, she accidentally crosses the river Styx and ends up in Hades part of town. And everyone thought Hades was gone, but he's still there. And 
they decide to um, form a union in that they will use each other to show Zeus that he is um, not in control of everything. And so far it's very good. The writing is not the best, but I am flying through it and really enjoying it. So recommend that. Um, and Rebecca, go ahead. I was gonna say, have people read The Flat Share? Does that count as a romance? It does. Oh my God, that is a wonderful romance. And one I of the loved good, it. good, good things about it is that it's like a romance for people who don't like romance because the right. characters really have a lot going on in their lives. But as a romance reader, I also absolutely adored that they had a lot going on in their lives because I, as a longtime romance reader, I'm sort of like, yeah, 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 I know they're going to end up together. So like, give me some meat in between. And it, that, the flat share was really good for that. I yeah. really enjoyed that. I'm not typically a romance reader, but I really liked that. And that is, um, that I like, we could give you more romances like that because, you know, you might be thinking that like you read a Harlequin presents back when <laughs> you were younger or something, you were like, this just really isn't to my taste, but there are lots and lots of contemporary romances where, you know, people are not, you know, classically beautiful and perfectly thin and so on. And, um, I, yeah, we can give you more if you want them. Or, or they have something else going on. Like, um, so th that was the flat share by uh, Beth O'Leary, which Beth O'Leary is a great um, sure bet for someone that just like, I would like a book uh, with a little, not, they don't even have to say the word romance, but they might say like with a love story or with a happy ending, you could totally give them the flat share. I would say all of the three Talia Hibbert books, the characters have something else going on. Um, um you know uh adhd in one case um like what is she it's not mecfs it's something else for the first one um but like yeah, i can't remember what it is either but she's got she's got a chronic illness that chronic illness um and and uh the matzo ball which i'm reading right now for our romance book club she does have mecfs fibromyalgia thanks laura um laura is recommending right. portrait of a scotsman by evie dunmore um so yes there's there's so much out there and so many sub, sub genres that you know if you like realistic you just wanted to end happily with a with a couple then you know uh, we can we can give you uh, something else to read. If you ever have any questions or want recommendations, we are ready to give you a stack. Um, yes, Romance in Space, Hunt the Stars by Jesse Mahalik is coming out in February. That's exciting. I like Jesse Mahalik's other books, so I will be on top of that. Sci-fi. I have not read this. This is something that's coming out from Sourcebooks in January, but it, I'm, I'm holding it up as like an example of a, a lot of romance covers that you will see right now. And it might be, these are, I think that these are the type of book that Rebecca might enjoy overall so. because, yeah, they're not like the flat share. They're, you know, they're not, just just romance but they're you know and they're they're can usually have a contemporary setting and you know maybe he just got hired as as like her competitor you know at the head of the department that is parallel to her department and they have like workplace stuff or you know they um like the alicia ray the right swipe i i love isn't that the one where the it's the football player that was the one night stand and then they didn't like talk again for six months because I mean and it was a tinder hookup that they kind of were like yeah this is a tinder hookup but then they were both sort of like hmm that was a real nice tinder hookup and then they like met again and it was both of them had something terrible happen in their lives immediately after that kept them from following up or whatever it's um but anyway look looking for this kind of thing in your bookstores and stuff is is a good way to find ideas for yourself and also to sort of get to know what's what's going on right now. Okay. 
Um, if you've got more recommendations, you can put them in the chat. And I guess we will work on our other agenda items. Mm -hmm. And we are seriously not kidding. If you wanted to email us individually, or if you wanted to email ra at mla.org, we would be thrilled to give you lists of things that we think you might like. Or that you can tell us thinking. about what you liked, you know, so that we do a better job. But um, we, we, we would just give you a whole bunch, a list of like eight things to like figure out what you liked too. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>